Hi, everyone. Uh, so um, just a couple of things. We're running a little late. We're going to try to get you out of here on time. However, we still, I think it's a better presentation when we interact. So if you want to ask questions as we're giving the presentation, please raise your hands. We're glad to answer them. Um, just very briefly about Perkins Coie. Perkins Coie is a thousand lawyer law firm headquartered in Seattle. We have a uh, broad experience working with technology companies, uh, including life sciences companies from day one through IPO. Um, I'm in the emerging companies group, so I basically help entrepreneurs like you form companies. And um, I'm basically their outside general counsel from day one through either being acquired or, or going public. Um, my colleagues over here, uh, Pat Morris is in our San Francisco office. Laura Dupin is in our Los Angeles office. They do IP, both patent prosecution and IP litigation. And my other colleague, Javier, Gar <laughs> Javier um, does um, employment law in, um, formerly based in Seattle, now in, the, uh, now in our Los Angeles office. So he has Washington expertise uh, as well as California expertise. Um, so we're going to talk about what are the attributes of a successful startup. Um, also, or you can phrase it differently, what attributes do you not want to have to be a successful startup? What not to do? First, we're going to go over the corporate, capital, and legal structure, and then we'll discuss intellectual property, and then if there are any other questions, we'll do Q&A at the end as well. Um, so corporate structure. Uh, typically, a venture-backed company is going to be a Delaware C corporation. Um, the reason you want an entity is to have limited liability for uh, the stockholders and the board of directors. Um, in other words, the entity itself can contract and the liabilities of the entity are only the entities, uh, provided that the entity, the corporation in this case, is uh, following proper uh, corporate formalities. Now, uh, a Delaware C corporation, unlike a Delaware S corporation or maybe an LLC, uh, is not a pass-through entity. So it has a double, uh, double layer of taxation. If it has income, uh, it gets taxed for that income like an individual does. And then it, when, when it turns around and distributes that income to its stockholders, to its owners, uh, that, that gets taxed as well. And oftentimes you'll, um, or I'll meet with an entrepreneur and the entrepreneur will be concerned that um, they don't want this double taxation because uh, God forbid they be taxed twice. But um, the truth is most venture-backed companies, A, won't have enough profit to distribute to its owners, to its stockholders in the first place. So it'll never see that, that kind of double taxation. A lot of, especially life sciences companies, are never profitable before they, they go public or get acquired. Um, and even if they were profitable and had enough uh, funds to distribute to its owners, um, they wouldn't distribute them. I mean, generally startups take the funds uh, that they're making and reinvest them in the company. So uh, that double taxation, not that bad. Um, another reason that double taxation is not bad is that venture capital funds uh, don't want to deal with the hassle of a pass-through entity. Um, basically, an LLC or a pass-through entity will have to allocate its uh, profits and losses to its members and issue them a K-1. Um, imagine a venture capital fund that has 20 investments, all of which are passed through entities. They'd uh, have to get 20 K-1s, and it would just really complicate their, their tax returns. Venture capital funds are generally OK just making their investment one time, getting the stock, and there's no tax effect to them until the company either gets acquired and they get paid out that way, or the, or the company goes public and then they're able to sell their stock on the market. Um, so going back to the reasons why Delaware C Corp is a popular, um, popular entity structure, um, the reason Delaware is popular for where you incorporate, and where you incorporate is where you form the company. So the corporate law of the state where the company is formed is what's going to apply to the company, is that Delaware, since the early 1900s, has kind of established itself as the place to, uh, place to form an entity. Initially. Uh, it was because it had, uh, I guess, favorable tax laws. But over the years, so many companies have been drawn there. The statute that governs corporations there has been so well developed. Its courts, and they actually have special courts that just deal with corporate issues, their chancery courts, have developed so much case law that it's just a solid place to go if you want certainty in the way the law is going to be interpreted. And on top of that, 
um, the Delaware law also gives the benefit of the doubt. It, it's very protective of, uh, of management. So it gives uh, kind of business judgment or defers to the business judgment of both the board of directors and the officers of a company. So um, if you're a venture backed company or want to be a venture backed company, that's really attractive to a VC who um, may be putting someone on your board. They want that protection. Um, another reason you're going to have a Delaware C Corp is that you're able to uh, grant conventional stock options. So, you know, a lot of people, a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of people who work uh, in the VC, sorry, in the technology sector, um, even if they don't necessarily understand stock options, they generally have a good idea of how they work and think they understand them and they're comfortable with them. Um, LLCs can issue stock options. They can issue unit options and those don't quite work the same. Um, another option in an LLC is something called a profits interest, which is kind of like a phantom or kind of like a stock appreciation, right? Not the same. I've had uh, companies that couldn't get the employees they wanted or the other service providers they wanted because the service provider wanted to see a stock option, not a profits interest or an LLC option. Um, and then kind of the last two factors for why you're gonna go with the Delaware C Corp, I've already covered venture capital uh, firms like them because they're protective of them and they understand them and they see them all the time. Um, and a corporation has relatively low startup costs. Um, to form a corporation, you need to file a charter, you need bylaws, and almost every law firm's bylaws look the same. The bylaws are basically the rules of how you have board and stockholder meetings and how you take corporate actions. Um, and, uh, you know, kind of the common stock purchase agreements pursuant to which founders buy their shares are, are pretty standard as well. Um, any questions so far? Okay. So moving on to capitalization. Um, when we talk about capitalization, uh, it's really one of two things we're talking about. It's who owns the stock or how much money the company got for that stock. How much capital does it have? Um, a typical startup um, is set up with what's called uh, 20,000 shares of authorized common stock. That's basically all the common stock that the company can issue. Um, it doesn't mean it's gonna use it all or it's gonna issue it all, but it's kind of like what it has in reserve to either issue or, well, to issue or to kind of cover warrants or options that it's going to issue. Um, every once in a while, it'll have what it's called a blank check preferred stock reserved as well. And the notion there is that you're uh, authorizing, in this case, usually about 10 million shares of preferred stock that can be um, given rights or whose rights can be set forth later on to issue to investors. In the end, the blank check preferred usually isn't used. Usually, you file a whole new charter where the preferred stock's rights are specified very clearly, but it's just kind of a convention that's, that you know, usually happens. Um, a typical startup will be set up with a, what's called a fully diluted capitalization of 10 million shares. And that means that between the shares issued to founders, and I use founders broadly, it can be the individuals who are working in the company, it can be the university that uh, gave a license, um, between what the founders get shares actually issued, and the shares reserved in the option pool for grant to future service providers, there's a total of 10 million shares. Usually that option pool will be between uh, 10 to 20% of that 10 million. In this example we're using here, we're saying that the founders got 8 million shares of common stock, and the, the option pool has 2 million shares. So 8 plus 2, 10, 10 million fully diluted. Um, the presenter before was talking about pre-money valuation. Um, and that's a word that gets used a lot, and I, I want to talk about, a little bit about how it's kind of a misconception. But all that pre-money is, is you take your fully diluted capital and you multiply it by the price you're selling your, your series or your current financing. And so if you're doing your series A at 50 cents a share um, and you have 10 million shares outstanding fully diluted, you multiply 10 million by 50 cents you have a $5 million pre-money valuation. Um, but when you think about it, that's, you know, you'll talk to some founders and even some investors and they'll say, well, the company's worth you know, $5 million. That's the pre-money. I mean, realistically, you can't go out and sell the company for $5 million, right? I mean, I think a lot of founders, if they could get the pre-money to sell their company, they, they might do it and move on, to their next, move on to their next venture. It's just kind of a rule of thumb to kind of value what's there. But, whether the, uh, the founders or the people already in the company before the financing could get $5 million 
if the company were sold the next day at 50 cents a share, it really depends on uh, the rights of the preferred stock, but we don't really have time to get into that. But just keep that in mind. It's just kind of a convention to generally value companies. It's not the real value you can go out and sell your company for. Um, your post-money valuation is just your fully diluted shares plus the shares you sold uh, in the financing times the price of the shares in the financing. So the example we have there is, let's say we did a $2 million Series A. So we sold uh, 4 million shares of Series A preferred stock at 50 cents. You take the 10 million fully diluted shares, add it to the 4 million fully diluted shares, that's a total of 14 million shares, multiply it by 50 cents, you get $7 million uh, post money valuation. Uh, you can also do it, call it a two on five. If you're saying that the pre-money was five million and you're adding two more to it, five plus two, seven million. Questions so far? And I'm gonna try to slow down because I feel like I'm rushing, so sorry. Um, sometimes founders will get what's called uh, class F common, or class A common stock or FF shares or class F common stock. Uh, this is common stock that's not quite preferred stock. Um, preferred stock is what investors get. They pay more for it than they do for common stock and it has generally liquidation preferences, dividend preferences, um, covenants that keep the company from doing things without the consent of the preferred stock. But it, this class F stock or class A stock has certain additional rights and it usually only goes to the main founders. So giving my example of 10 million shares fully diluted, um, the original founders would all get what we call class A stock. The option pool would be just regular common stock. And this class A stock has certain additional rights. Um, it can come in, you know, it doesn't have to be one way, there's various different flavors, but uh, kind of the, the most common right I see is that the uh, common stock is convertible into preferred stock in a future round to sell, for sale to investors. And what that does is it gives some liquidity to the founders in case they want it in the future and provided that the investors are okay with it. So um, as an example, usually don't do it in a Series A, but uh, let's say you're selling the 4 million shares of Series A, but the investors want more. The founders could convert some of their common stock into Series A and sell that Series A at the Series A price to these, to these investors. Um, other rights that Class A stock or Class A common stock can have is um, multiple votes per share, the ability to block certain actions by the company, um, the ability to elect directors. It's almost like a mini preferred stock that goes just to the true founders of the company. Um, generally, founder stock is gonna be subject to vesting. Um, are you all familiar with, with vesting and, uh, in, in the founder context? So the notion is um, if the founder stops providing service to the company, the company can repurchase those shares at the original purchase price. And the reason for this is you want all your founders to stick around till they've kind of provided usefulness to the company. Uh, you don't want a founder to be able to walk away on you know, day two of the company with his or her chunk of shares and kind of leave the other founders having to work and develop. So um, typically uh, the vesting is, kind of skipping this, but typically the vesting is gonna be four years. There's not gonna be a cliff. The cliff is this notion of you don't get the first chunk of shares until a few months have passed. So you don't get, for example, if you're doing uh, four year vesting, that's 1 48th of all of the shares per month. Uh, a six month cliff would mean you don't get vested or the right of repurchase doesn't last with respect to the first 6 48th of the total shares until six months have passed. Um, usually do that with people you don't know that well. You, usually, you don't do it with founders. Uh, but, so typically founders won't have a cliff. They will have acceleration upon a change of control though. Um, and you can do what's called single trigger acceleration or double trigger acceleration. Uh, single tri trigger acceleration is just the company gets acquired, all of the shares vest, which means that when the company gets acquired, the founder gets paid for all of his or her shares. Um, and I like that. I mean, the notion is if the if you founder was able to sell the shares, uh, he or she's done her job, or sell the company, he or she has done her job. Um, however, sometimes we'll have what's called double trigger acceleration. And in that case, the acceleration doesn't happen um, unless the company gets acquired and the founder's terminated uh, without cause. And the notion there is that the company may need the founder to stick around after it's been acquired to kind of fulfill um, what it needs to do. And that kind of serves as an anchor to keep the, 
keep the founder there working for the company. Even if he or she doesn't have shares of the company after the acquisition, the notion is there's some momentum to kind of keep that trigger there for whatever considerations received from the acquirer. Um, going back though, um, this four-year vesting I described, um, you don't always start it on the day you incorporated the company. Oftentimes founders will have worked on the company for some time before it gets incorporated. So you'll generally give founders credit for that time worked beforehand. So if four of you are working on a company, you haven't incorporated it, you wait a year, then incorporate, you might start with a year's worth of vesting or a year's worth of shares already vested, one quarter of them, um, and do the rest of the vesting over three years with change of control. Um, a problem that arises when you have vesting shares or shares subject to a right of repurchase is that the IRS takes the position, which I think is ridiculous, that you don't really own the shares until the shares are vested. Um, which, you know, whatever, that sounds like, so what's the big deal? The problem is if the company's shares have gone up in value and you're, you know, let's say you vest, uh, you know, again, 148th a month, you started on day zero, um, the IRS takes the position that if the, the shares have gone up in value, you're purchasing the shares for your original purchase price and any spread between that original purchase price and the current value of the shares when they vest is income to you. So an 83B election is an election that has to be made by the purchaser of the stock um, within 30 days of purchase in order that the IRS not treat the shares that way. So as you kind of move into uh, building companies, 83B elections will become an issue. And when you get investors, there's actually a representation in the, per in the preferred stock purchase agreements that says, you know, to my knowledge or to the company's knowledge, uh, all of the people who purchase shares subject to vesting have filed 83B elections. Um, and the reason the company cares is because if the stockholder is receiving income as the shares vest, the company has certain withholding obligations, which are a total pain to follow, by the way. So you want your company to make sure that all, uh, all its stockholders have filed 83B elections. Question? So, yeah, I was about to ask, so 83B is available to anyone who decides that they I mean, pretty much would want to do that? Okay. From the company's perspective, yes, because any spread between the purchase price and the value at vesting, if higher, is going to be something the company is going to have to withhold on and report on. It's a, it's a real hassle. And it's, you know, obviously the stockholder also wants to do it because, um, because they don't want to be taxed on that spread. Like imagine a company that sold founder shares for a penny a share, usually less, right? And then it has a financing and now the shares are worth, uh, well, the preferred stock is worth, let's say, a dollar, which means the common stock's now worth probably more than 10 cents. Every time a share vests, that's 10 cents in income, or a little bit over, you know, around 10 cents in income. It can really add up for companies that are very successful. The organizational structure of the company is, is as follows. The board of directors is elected by the stockholders, and it kind of ha has overall control of the company. Uh, it doesn't run day to day, but it tells the company, uh, or it directs the company when it's going to issue shares, uh, make acquisitions, or be acquired. The board of directors has kind of overall control of the company. Executive officers um, and Delaware corporations need to have at least a CEO slash president, a secretary slash treasurer, sorry, um, CFO slash treasurer, and a secretary. They run the day-to-day -day of the company. Um, you know, hiring, firing, signing contracts, stuff like that. Employees obviously do all the work, uh, but not everyone is an employee. There's also uh, consultants and advisors. Um, and role of the stockholders is what I said at the beginning. They elect the directors, and they also have the ability or the right to consent to certain transactions. If the company amends its charter, generally the stockholders get to vote on that. If the company is going to get acquired, they get to vote on that as well. Um, and here, Javier, feel free to interrupt me when I butcher some kind of employment law issue, but um, it's really important to classify your employees properly. Um, I can't speak to laws of other states. In fact, I probably shouldn't speak to California law because I'm not an employment attorney. But um, each state and the federal government has very specific rules as to what constitutes an employee. And the reason they care about that is, one, because they protect employees uh, and employees are entitled to certain benefits, but two, because they want to collect payroll tax. So, um, you know, the state and the federal government's position is if it quacks like a duck, uh, if it looks like a duck, quacks like a duck, it's a duck or an employee. Um, among the things that uh, employees get is a minimum wage. So 
I, I'm not even sure what the minimum wage is in California right now, Javier. I don't know either. It keeps going up every year. But right. It's like a little bit north of $9. And then there's certain jurisdictions that have, um, you know, additional requirements. Like I know in San Francisco, the minimum wage is actually higher than the federal minimum wage. Excuse me. Sorry. Hello. Um, so employees are entitled to overtime if they work more than 10 hours in a day or 40 hours in a week. So that's one important thing. That's regular employees. Um, but there's two types of employees. There's regular employees and exempt employees. Exempt employees are generally managers. And their minimum wage is actually about twice minimum wage uh, for 40 hours a week, 52, 52 weeks a year. Um, there are some companies that try to classify all of their service providers as contractors. But if someone shows up to your offices, has a title, is using all of the company's resources, you know, under the test that the federal and state government have here, they're probably employees. And then there are other companies who don't want to pay over. Oh, and there are other companies that don't want to pay overtime. Um, the key, you know, the important thing about being in a, 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 an exempt employee, a manager, is that they don't get overtime. So I, I've had companies that want to classify everyone at the company as an exempt employee, and they're willing to pay them, you know, twice minimum wage, but. Again, you can't have all managers, all supervisors. So it's really important you, you know, talk to either your HR person or an employment attorney to make sure you're properly classifying uh, your, your service providers, because you don't want to be subject to, to the penalties that come with that. I mean, uh, wage and hour claims are not waivable. They're subject to very large penalties. It's, it's just a, a real hassle. So continuing on, on general labor law matters, uh, there are certain agreements you're going to make your uh, employees and consultants sign. Uh, one's the Employee Confidential Information and Inventions Agreement. There's other names it goes by, uh, Proprietary Information and Inventions Agreement, or the acronym for that, PIA. Um, all the founders sign this. I'll go into what it does in a second, but it's basically a form that all employees sign that uh, uh, that's the same for everyone. It basically says, uh, I, employee, will keep the company's information confidential. I will not compete with the company while I'm employed by the company. And anything I develop on behalf of the company will belong in the company, any kind of invention. Um, I know you're not all from California, but there's this notion that in California, non-competes are not enforceable. But that's not, I mean, that's true post-employment. Once you get terminated, uh, unless you sold your chunk of the company back to the company, uh, and that, was significant, that had significant value, um, uh, 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 non-competition agreement is not enforceable. But while you're employed by the company, non-competitions are generally enforceable. It's not super clear, but there is a duty of loyalty that California courts enforce, and that's kind of turned into uh, non-competition non while, while employed. Um, with other service providers who aren't employees, you'll have them sign either consulting agreements or advisory board agreements. Um, I think you all are probably familiar with the notion of an, of an advisory board. Basically, uh, someone who is very experienced in your field who can give you advice or introduce you to investors. Uh, they're not employees, so the other thing, you know, they're consultants. Um, and they sign a specific kind of consulting agreement. But like the employee confidential information is an inventions agreement, the consulting agreements and advisory board agreements establish what the role of the service provider is, um, what confidentiality obligations they have, and what uh, obligations to assign rights um, to, uh, to the company they have. And finally, sometimes you'll also see an employee manual. Um, not all companies have them. They'll kind of re, you know, set forth, again, some of these obligations employees have. Some employee manuals actually apply to consultants, too. Uh, and it's just kind of a guideline that sets forth um, the company's obligations, but more importantly, the employee's or service provider's obligations. Um, OK, so um, moving on to assignment of intellectual property, protection of confidentiality. Uh, as I mentioned on the last slide, um, the Employee Confidential Information and Inventions Agreement um, sets forth confidentiality obligations, um, inventions assignment obligations, and non-competition obligations of employees. In jurisdictions out of other than California, sometimes there will be post-employment non-competition obligations. Before a founder becomes an employee, though, before the company is formed, they've oftentimes developed technology, or IP. And that's why it's important to have a technology assignment agreement. So as part of the founder buying his or her shares, 
they pay for part of those shares oftentimes by assigning whatever IP they've developed. Um, so that's another kind of agreement in this vein. Um, the last kind of IP agreement we'll talk about, oops, sorry, oh, there's more. But last kind of IP related agreement we'll talk about in this slide are license agreements. Uh, a lot of you are working with universities. Um, the most important agreement you're gonna have when you first uh, form the company is to get your license from the university. Universities never turn over ownership of their IP. They just uh, give a license to the company. Um, universities are the only kind of uh, player in venture-backed startups that can do that. If a founder tries to assign his or her IP to the company, uh, you know, a, a VC fund's not gonna accept that. They want the company to own it. Universities, they do allow. I think we can skip, skip these, except I'll say non-disclosure agreements, also very important. If the company is having discussions with a third party, um, it's important to protect the information that's being disclosed. Uh, non-disclosure agreements come in, in kind of two flavors. They can, be, they can be unilateral, where only the company is disclosing and the other party agrees to keep uh, that information confidential and to not use it for any other purpose, or they can be mutual where both parties are disclosing information and um, both have obligations to keep um, that, the information being disclosed by the other uh, confidential and to not use it for any reason other than some kind of purpose like discuss, discussing a potential uh, business relationship.